Good evening. Welcome to Sport Kingdom Moments. I uh, pray you've had a great day uh, worshiping our, our King and our Lord. It has been a long day. Well, we've had a lot going on in it, but didn't want to miss a year. Trying to catch up on these and not making great headway, but didn't want to miss a day in here. But we are in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 5 to 10. It's still kind of John's intro into the letter, and he, he wants to get some things out. But one of the things I wanted to bring up is, is the fact that, that when you find your best athletes, that they are ones that want to be pushed the hardest. They, they are ones that want to take correction, take instruction. That There's just something different about their work ethic, their drive and desire, and they, they want to be a part of a program where uh, they're not just told, great job, just keep doing it, but where they, again, are are pushed, instructed, corrected, you know, rebuked, but with the purpose of making them better. They want feedback. They, they want to hear, and they want to be pushed. And they want to be pushed hard because um, they know it's the only way they're going to make what, what they ultimately want and where they're achieving. And I would hope that would be true for us in the Lord as well, that, that, that those of you that want to grow, that really, man, just can't believe that that. God would do all that he's done through his son, would, would want to be a part of a place that, that you were in this book, in God's word, being instructed, being corrected. Um, it, it's 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. We're told all scriptures, God breathed useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And it's ultimately that we would be thoroughly equipped and trained up. And, and so all of that takes place, but it doesn't take place with a bunch of people who don't really want to grow. I mean, if you want to grow, you don't want to be surrounded by a bunch of people that don't care to, to dig in, that are afraid of getting their feelings hurt, that, that don't want to be, you know, as iron sharpens iron, don't want to be in context of something that makes them better. We, we want to be in a place that we grow because it is worth whatever discomfort here and now to gain what is to come. What doesn't make sense is to want comfort now and miss out on, on the incredible gain that is to come. And so I pray that that is your mindset or it's one that you're growing into, that, that Lord, send me people my way that, man, when they when they teach out this book, it, it it causes me to have one and need to dig in further to go, is that really what that says? And if that's true, then how do I live this out? So we, we've got a little bit, we've got a great promise in, in this little short section. So let me dig in. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if I ask you to describe God, what, what words would come to mind? And, and the one scripture gives us in Isaiah is that he is not just holy or holy, holy, but he is holy, holy, holy. And there is no other description of God that, that goes to the third degree on that. It doesn't say he's love, love, love. Or, or peace, peace, peace. Is God all loving? Yes. Is God the God of all peace? Yes. But, but what it says about him is that he is holy, holy, holy. There is no darkness in him. There is no sin, no hint of, of error that, that God is light. He is the light of the world. He sends his son as the light of the world. Uh, God's word is a lamp unto our feet. We, we can go on and on with those illustrations, but, but he wants to make it clear that we get right out of the chute of God's holiness, the fact that God is light, there's no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And we kind of, you've noticed when the lights come on, it's no longer dark. Like you don't have kind of dark or kind of light. It's, yeah, I know we get to dusk and things, but it's, it's either still light out or it's not light out. I, I remember when the street light would, would come on in the neighborhood. You know, and you start hearing the, the calls and, and the bells, and, and we were to start heading home different places. You're trying to squeeze out one more at bat, one more one more pass, one more shot with a basket. You were, you were trying to elongate it, but it was time to head in. Uh, well, in this situation, if we are with God and in fellowship with Him, that means we're in the light. There, there can't be any darkness there. That, that he, he dispels all darkness. Uh, and, and so we, we're either with him or we're not with him. We can't kind of kind of be with him. And, and that's what this passage is bearing out a little bit in this. Um, but if we walk in the light, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. 
What great promise in, in that, that, that as we walk together, if, if you're his and following Jesus and I'm following Jesus, then we are in the light. His blood has cleansed us and removed all of that. We, we are justified in his sight. We, we are made clean and made uh, in his image. Does that mean that we will never sin again? That, that's not what's coming out here. But if we do, we're going to feel awful about it and we're going to be quick to repent and confess. You know, we're going to want to grow from it. We're going to move on from it. What it's saying is that you and I aren't going to just start to go, well, we'll just hide this and we'll just not tell anybody about that. We can, we can kind of have it both ways. And we just really can't. Grace is sufficient and covers a multitude of sins. But the fact is that if we are His and His Spirit and walking in the light, we're, we're going to be pushed. We're going to be rebuked. We're going to be corrected. His Spirit is, is going to grab hold of our hearts and convict in a way that things begin to change. John wants us to know whether or not we truly belong to Jesus or not. He's going to keep pushing on some of these things all through this letter that, that we might know whether or not we belong to Christ. Because if not, then, then let's, let's get back on our knees and try to figure this out. And, and that's some of John's heart in all of this. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yeah, like The follower of Christ, first and foremost, is aware of his sinfulness. I know we're in a cultural thing today where, where folks, there are folks out there who say they don't sin, they just make mistakes. A mistake is two plus two equals five. R.C. Sproul put it this way, that, that, that an act of sin, on the other hand, is, is treason. It is, it is a hateful, evil act against a holy God of grace, that, that there's no mistake in it. You, you, are, you are turning right at him and, and defying him and, and throwing it right in his face. That's our sin, and we are sinners, and, and, and we need Jesus desperately to change who we are. And, and so John wants again to bring that out, that, that it's, it's not just, we don't suddenly say, well, I don't sin anymore. No, I, I still sin, and I still need his forgiveness. But man, when I do, I'm aware of it. I confess, I repent, and, and I want to move on. And, and I may mess up again. But, but that process starts to be the, the norm and quick and regular because we get this next promise verse in verse 9. Um, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, that I have an avenue through Christ that when I sin, again, I'm, I'm striving not to, and I've got God's word and I've got people in my life and, and I'm, I'm trying to walk this thing right, but, but I know when I do, not really even if, because until Christ brings us home, sanctification is not complete. When I do, I know that, that I have, have an advocate and I confess my sins and, and he's paid for it already. The reality is I've already been forgiven. Christ died for sins once for all, the just or the righteous for the unrighteous in order to bring us to God. That, that's a completed act. Jesus' death, pain for sin was all sin, past, present, and all future. But, but I still come and I confess because I, I want to reestablish the fact that I, I know I've broken that fellowship. I, I've done things that, that I know I shouldn't have done, and, and I don't want that to continue. And the great news is that I'm forgiven of that. And so I come and I confess it. Are you quick to confess those things in your life that come up? Are you aware of that which is sin, which is in God's face, and that which isn't? Again, the more we study and read here, the more we're aware of our sin and, and what's there. The purpose of God's law was just that. It was to be a mirror so that when we looked in it, it reflected an understanding that, that, that we were broken, that we weren't able to keep all of it, that we needed someone to come, that being Jesus, to take care of the penalty and the wage that you and I had earned. So anyway, great verse. I hope you'll go back to it. I hope you'll memorize it, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that which you didn't even know you did wrong gets forgiven in that process. I can't very well confess for that which I didn't know. Again, God and his spirit, the more we spend time walking with him, the more we're going to know. And then I pray the quicker we are to confess it. So verse 10, if we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, we're back to just the absolute epitome of pride, right, would be to say that I haven't sinned. He's provided everything we need, need to, to be forgiven, to confess it. Well, why on earth would I 
You'll see that on a field. So it was always my pet peeve. Some someone make a absolute mental break mistake that cost something big, and, and that's okay. I mean, it's not okay in the end, but but it is okay. But then they kind of do this, like my bad. Well, everybody in the stadium recognizes it was your bad. <laughs> we just saw it, and now there, there are cases where it was someone else's mistake in there. But this whole my my bad. Well. I would much rather, for Christians, I don't need to go, I, I messed up. I'd much rather we drop to our knees and confess our sin and ask for forgiveness. And that we do that where we're told to confess to one another. Do we need to confess to one another to be forgiven? No. Is it a great help of accountability if we confess to one another? That I acknowledge to you that, that I understand that this, this was sinful and wrong and I don't want to go there again. I would like you to... Because it's not as obvious as seeing something on a field. It often goes un unnoticed. I, I learned far more from guys that disciple me, I think, from, from when they came in times like that than, than, than normal times. Because there was humility and there was brokenness. And God's grace came flooding in. You, you can be used by God without being perfect because you're not. <clears throat> but you need to be honest and upfront and open about the fact of, of how you live life. And I pray that we are that with one another. The object, again, is to be pushed, to be instructed so that we can be corrected, so that we can get on the right path and grow. I pray that that describes your spiritual life today, that you just want to grow and want to move forward. Heavenly Father, I thank you and love you, Lord. I thank you for the truth and the promises from John in this letter as we open it up. I pray that we would understand that you are in the light and that you remove darkness and your desire is to free us from the darkness. And your son has provided all we need and your spirit then indwelling us gives us all that we need to live this life to your glory and honor. And I pray that we would begin to do so. We would want to be surrounded by people that are hungry to grow and be obedient in you. That we don't look for a comfort level of people that we think we can coast in, but that we look for folks that are truly getting after it for you and that we come alongside of, and that we be that for other people, that we would be a mark that pulls people out of comfort and into growth in areas where we step into the light and fully love being in the light, even though it exposes things in us that need to grow. But again, Lord, we thank you, love you. We look forward to what you have as this new week starts up and we start the work week tomorrow or school week. We give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. You all have a great night.